Greetings, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be coming to you on this beautiful day. And I'm over here in an area called Heatherfield, and it's part of our original uh, prairie land. And uh, it's called the Techni Basin Conservation Area. It's a very beautiful place. And we're coming to you today for several reasons. First of all, I'm trying to promote the concept of disabled people getting out on a trike after, of course, checking with your doctor in order to have some fun, to get good exercise. And uh, it's just a great thing to do. And as you know, uh, for those of you who follow my videos, I had a major pulmonary embolism February 21st. And thank thankfully, I've made a good recovery from that. And part of that recovery has been getting back into a good exercise program. And the, the best way for me to do that, of course, was to be riding a trike. I have issues with my uh, back and uh, I can't walk very well and balance issues are a problem. But with the trike, uh, all of those things disappear. Now, the other reason that I'm so interested in talking to you today is that I'm really very frustrated. I have been a physician involved in thrombosis on your left, thank you, for over 50 years. And it's amazing to me that we still have a problem with fatal pulmonary embolism. It's the most preventable problem for those hospitalized patients and for after surgery. And you would think given all of that information and all of these years and all of the data that this wouldn't be that much of a problem anymore, but that's not really true. I was reading the other day, I try to stay up on the internet and I watched a wonderful program out of a major university in the East that was talking about the guidelines for medical patients, medical patients at risk. And they were talking about the CHESS 2012 guidelines that recommended using prophylaxis for hospitalized patients as long as they were immobile and until they got discharged, but not continuing the prophylaxis after they went home. Then, the next statement during this lecture was to say that, well, the guidelines really haven't changed between that time and 2018, when again, for medically ill patients, the same recommendations were present. Remember, using in-hospital prophylaxis, a course of in-hospital prophylaxis, as long as the patient is immobile or until the patient is discharged. But we feel that we uh, suggest against providing ongoing prophylaxis when you come home from the, the hospital. So now I'd like to go back to data that's in the literature for many years. And let us begin. I think the best place to begin is to talk about the fact that the RIETE database is a worldwide database. It has now over 100,000 patients in it. And this database consists of physicians putting their patients in the database who have suffered a DVT. Why they were, we got their DVT, how they were treated, what were their outcomes, recurrence rates, death rates, and so forth bleeding rates, uh, all using real-world data. And in 2008, a brilliant professor, Juan Arcelis and his associates, looked at the RIEDA, RIEDA database 
and they reported that 77% of people, or three quarters of people who were in the database with a blood clot, got their blood clot after they were discharged from the hospital. And over half of them got that blood clot after anticoagulation was stopped. Then, let's roll forward to 2020. Professor Arcellus again queries the database, this time for non-cancer abdominal surgery patients. And he finds the same data, so that we know that there's a large number of patients that get their clots when they go home from the hospital, and also after prophylaxis is discontinued. Now here is the question. What is the period of efficacy for providing venous thromboembolism prophylaxis based on the literature that we know? Well, in 1975, Professor V.B. Kekar organized a trial in a number of centers in the United Kingdom and Europe. And there were, at the time, about 4,000 patients. And these patients were surgical patients who either were given small doses of unfractionated heparin before and after surgery or not. Because in those days, it wasn't common to give anticoagulation to surgical patients, naturally because the surgeons would be afraid that they would bleed. The results of the trial showed that there was a 30% incidence of DVT in the, in the control group. And this was measured by fibrinogen scans confirmed with venography. So very, very sensitive endpoints. He also found that in this trial of over 4,000 patients, there were 16 deaths in the control group from fatal pulmonary emboli and two in the treated group. So it was highly successful. Naturally, you may imagine that in 1975, these data were received with a great deal of skepticism, especially since it was a very revolutionary concept. Now let's roll the clock ahead 15 years, 1988. Rory Collins, an Oxford scholar, took a look at all of the trials using the same design as the KCAR trial that were done around the world in that intervening period. And I guess from, 2000, uh, from 1975 to 1988 is 13 years. In any event, there were 70 additional trials. And in these 70 additional trials, the results were exactly the same. There were 13,500 patients that were divided between control and treated with heparin. And there was a 66% reduction in fatal pulmonary embolism deaths in that period of time using unfractionated heparin. The overall incidence was nine tenths of a percent, reduced to three tenths of a percent. Now, there were six bleeding deaths in the control group and seven in the treated group. So bleeding wasn't an issue. So these patients were protected against fatal pulmonary emboli by the administration of small doses of heparin after surgery. And I'd like to point out, again, we have the same endpoints, fibrinogen scans with duplex, uh, with, uh, with venographic confirmation. And I would like to point out at this juncture that what was the period of efficacy? What was the period of treatment? It was seven to 10 days. So now you have 20,000 patients from a total of 96 medical centers around the world over a 13 year period, all showing the same thing. Small doses of heparin given after surgery don't increase the, the fatal bleeding rate, but they dramatically lower the incidence of fatal pulmonary emboli. Well, apples don't fall far from the tree. And the Lord Kekar, AJ Kekar, who's the son of VJ, teamed up with a brilliant internist from Germany, Sylvia Haas, 
and they published a trial of 23,000 surgical patients, 79% of them non-orthopedic. And this trial was comparing heparin, small doses of heparin, to a new low molecular weight heparin, and it was sponsored by a company who was interested in seeing whether or not that low molecular weight heparin could prevent deaths better than the unfractionated heparin. So the endpoint was autopsy adjudicated fatal pulmonary emboli. And guess what? In the 23,000 surgical patients, it didn't make any difference whether you got unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin, your incidence of fatal pulmonary emboli, autopsy proven, was around a tenth of a percent. Now, right away, the skeptics jumped in and said, well, there were certain patients that died that you did not subject to an autopsy, so you're not sure. And so the author said, fine. We include all of those patients who didn't get an autopsy but died as having fatal pulmonary emboli, so now that lowers our percentage to 0.5 tenths of 1%. What was the period of efficacy in those trials? Seven to 20 days. So, let's recap here. We have 43,000 patients studied in the period of 1975 to 2005, showing that the fatal pulmonary embolism rate was a half a percent if they were given a proper course of seven to 10 days or longer of low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. Now let's get back to the guidelines. Now you're gonna say right away, I'm giving you all surgical data and these are medical patients. Well, remember when I started talking about this and referred to the RIADE database, the RIADE database were all patients, medical and surgical. That's the first thing. The next thing is that these patients all suffered blood clots after they left the hospital in many cases. And that's the key here. Now, I believe that they made recommendations that were counter to that for a number of different reasons. Economic, small trials that showed that the incidence of bleeding was increased in patients who were sent home on low molecular weight heparin, for example. But what was lacking was specific individual risk assessment of those patients. And now subsequent data has shown, and this is where I come back to what was stated by saying that the CHESS guidelines and the ASH guidelines, they didn't really change the recommendations for prophylaxis. And that holds true for surgical patients as well. But there's a lot of data there that was missed. For example, in 2014, Boston University published the first of 16 papers using the Caprini score in surgical patients where the score had to be done ahead of time and a period of prophylaxis that corresponded to their risk level had to be followed before you could sign the orders. Now, there was no penalty if you didn't follow them, but then you would be asked why you didn't follow them. So here's the data. Patients with a Caprini score of zero to four, you could do what you wanted in the hospital. But if the score was five to eight, they required seven days of low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis. Didn't make any difference if you went home or not during that period of time. 89% of the patients in the study followed that seven day routine. Then if the score was nine or above, they were required to receive 30 days of low molecular weight heparin regardless if they were in the hospital or not. Now, and 77% of people complied with that protocol. Now you might say that's kind of a nice lofty goal, especially if you consider uh, being in an affluent area. Well, Boston University is the number one safety net hospital in the New England area, also responsible for the care of the indigent patients. And they made a deal with the drug companies that any patient that would need the prophylaxis would get it regardless of their ability to pay. 
and their overall VTE rate at 30 days, including deaths, was less than a percent. It was around a half a percent. Now, the, the most astonishing thing about this is that that level of protection, half a percent of VTE events, persisted for the next 10 years at Boston University. I'm sorry to say that the ASH 2019 surgical guidelines didn't pick any of this information up. On your left, thank you. Yet, it's a very important strategy to reduce the incidence of fatal pulmonary embolism events. Now I want to switch gears just slightly. In 2006, the Surgical Care Improvement Project mandated that every patient undergoing a surgical procedure get anticoagulant prophylaxis within 24 hours of surgery unless they had a risk of bleeding. And this policy was followed, but a brilliant researcher, a lady by the name of Alton, published a study from the VA in 40,000 surgical patients who followed the SKIP protocol. 89% got their shot within 24 hours of surgery, and 11% didn't. Incidence of DVT unchanged, 1.3 and 1.4%. Subsequent to that study, that Surgical Care Improvement Project, or SKIP mandate, was removed. And yet, today, we still have many people prescribing a single shot of low molecular weight heparin. I uh, uh, reviewed a, uh, an audit of patients undergoing varicose vein ablation procedures where the risk of thrombosis is low, uh, and 71% of the respondents, the physicians who performed the procedure, stated that they gave a single dose of low molecular weight heparin prior to the procedure and no more. And so this is another area that needs clarification. But as far as we know, a single dose of low molecular weight heparin does not do anything to lower the venous thromboembolism rate. Now, there's an additional caveat here. And I'd like to bring up another study. Again, Ash didn't mention this that was a meta-analysis done in 2017 by a brilliant plastic surgery doctor by the name of Christopher Panucci. And he took a look at 16 of the early trials using the Caprini score. And what he found was that patients who did not receive prophylaxis but had a Caprini score of greater than eight had a 10% chance of blood clots. On the other hand, Patients with very low scores, less than five, who were given low molecular weight heparin, well, first of all, they had a low VTE rate, but it didn't change when they examined those lower risk patients by the, whether or not they got prophylaxis. So low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis doesn't really lower the VTE rate in low risk patients. It only increases the chance of bleeding. Now let's talk about another part of that guideline from chest and ash. Remember I said that the guideline says we don't recommend prophylaxis after, but we recommend prophylaxis as long as the patient is immobilized or in hospital. But once they are discharged, we don't recommend ongoing prophylaxis. Let's talk about ambulation. There's a very good definition of ambulation, which has been largely ignored by the medical community. And it comes from the Medinox trial, which was done in 1999. And in that trial, at the time, there was equipose in medical patients between whether or not to give prophylaxis. So they were given either low molecular weight heparin in a prophylactic dose or standard of care, which was not receiving anticoagulants. I'm on your left. Thank you very much. So, 
in that study, they did one additional thing. They proposed a definition of ambulation. And the definition was being able to walk 10 meters or 30 feet at one time using both legs. You could use a crutch or a cane or a walker, but you had to be using both legs and walk 30 feet. So now, let's think about this. So there really were four groups. And this was all brought to light in a subsequent sub-analysis by another brilliant man that I've had the privilege to know by the name of Al Peshamin. And so, in patients in the control group that didn't get low molecular weight heparin, the incidence of thrombosis, which was proven, was almost 20%, 19 point something percent. If they couldn't walk 30 feet, if they could walk the 30 feet, their risk of thrombosis was cut in half to less than 10%. Now, if the patients were receiving low molecular weight heparin, then those patients who couldn't walk 30 feet had a 9% incidence of venous thromboembolism, but, they, but if they could walk 30 feet, that risk was reduced by 66% relative risk reduction to 3%. So we've got a good definition of ambulation. It doesn't mean getting up and going to the chair. It doesn't mean walking to the bathroom several steps. It's a 30-foot walk. This has been largely ignored in publications and is a big problem. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. It's often quoted, including in those guidelines, that patients should receive prophylaxis as long as they're immobilized. Well. What happens when I get out of bed? Does everything go away? Let's talk about an individual patient, 75 years old, smoker all of his life, chronic obstructive lung disease, had a past history of cancer, treated successfully with surgery and chemotherapy, also has a sister who had a pulmonary embolus, and now came in for an operation, and now he's getting out of bed. Can we stop his prophylaxis? Of course not. The only risk factor that's improved as a result of this man getting out of bed is the risk factor of being immobilized in bed. Cancer, family history of thrombosis, COPD, none of those other age, none of those other risk factors go away. And yet oftentimes, I see this in hospital notes all the time. And so that's a very, very bad thing and in, even in some of the very exquisite studies, if the patient isn't listed at bed rest, they figure the patient is ambulating. So we've got a lot of work to do here, folks. We've got a lot of work to do. And I would suggest that the most important thing of any is to apply appropriate thrombosis prophylaxis for people at risk during the time that they're at risk. Now, I like the Caprini score, but not because my name's on it, because a lot of brilliant people developed this with me, and, you know, without which we wouldn't have it. But it's 40 factors. And if you take a look at 40 factors, it'll give you a pretty good idea who, who's likely to get a clot. But believe me, it's not the only road to Rome. Use whatever risk factor scoring you are familiar with and works in your hospital. Improve, improve D-dimer, the Geneva score, the Padua score, but use a score and make sure at discharge you score those patients carefully. And if they have continued risk factors, you give them ongoing prophylaxis. We do have a recent example from another brilliant, used to be young man, he's getting older, Alex Spiropoulos, who's done a tremendous amount of work in risk assessment with his Improve and Improve D-dimer score and teaming up with some very brilliant people, including Eduardo Ramacati from South America, they've come up with a Michelle trial that clearly shows that in patients who have COVID and have ongoing risks using the improved D-dimer score, benefit with 35 days of uh, DOAC for uh, prevention of venous thromboembolism. So remember folks, take a careful look at the literature. You can always write to me either through my website at www dot Caprini score risk Caprini risk score dot org or just go to jcaprini2 at aol.com where you can 
send me a question. I'll be very happy to address questions and comments. And most particularly, I love to keep learning. So negative comments are almost more important to me than positive comments, and all comments are welcome. So thank you very much. You all have a beautiful day, and I'm going to go back to showing you some more scenes of Heatherfield. On your left, got to take care of that beautiful family. Right out. And this is a preserve. The north branch of the Chicago River runs along the left side here, you can see. If we go over that way. And it's a beautiful basin. So thank you again for your attention. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. And take a look at the Caprini Venus Resource Center, which is my YouTube site, for more information. Have a nice day.